Hello, my name is Fraser Simons. This is my channel, Springboard Thought. Welcome to Canada, where it's very gloomy this time of year. And so the light is on behind me, but hopefully I look fine and not too washed out or weird. I guess we'll see. Today I'm going to be talking about In the Woods, the first book in the Dublin Murder Squad series by Tana French, which was adapted to television and actually what I watched first and then came to this a year or two later uh, after the sort of sheen or the luster was gone from my memories of the show. This is a very noir-esque narrated book in that uh, it primarily takes place with two people, Rob and Cassie, who are partners, and about 50 pages or so of the book is primarily dedicated just to setting up their relationship, uh, Rob's past, and how they met each other, what their partnership is like before they even catch the case that is in this book. A murder of a young girl takes place. Uh, it looks vaguely ritualistic in that she is killed and placed on an altar. Um, and she is displayed in such a way that a peripheral piece of evidence may tie into the backstory of Rob or Adam in which he used to live in this town as a young boy. He went into the woods with uh, three other kids, his best friends essentially, and he was the only one that came out of it. But the experience and the trauma has sealed off those memories from him. He's ostensibly tried to uh, get at them and is unable to and has since basically just moved on with his life. He went to school in England, he's got a very like upper uh, class accent and is treated as a British person and changed his name to Rob so that all of the media frenzy and all of the stuff that he was able to is put in the past and then he became a police officer so nobody knows this about him except for Cassie, his partner who used to work as an undercover agent and then got moved to the squad. Both of them are uh, the rookies of the squad. I think they're maybe not the primary or the, the newest people, but they're still regarded as rookies. And this is a fairly high profile case that they're dealing with. And so what ends up happening, because Rob is able to link these two cases throughout it, is he's able to try to work both cases, which is kind of a bad idea. <laughs> um, he's dredging up his past, essentially, and he's putting Cassie in an awkward position by doing this because uh, he, if anyone was to uncover his actual, I guess not identity, but who he is in relation to the case, they would probably take him off of it. And then add on to that, that he is also trying to uh, work his own case. It's definitely not allowed. So there's some tension there, but primarily as I see it, the B-plot for me takes precedence in this story, and the B-plot is between Cassie and Rob. Their relationship, as well as um, the extra bodies that they pick up from the murder squad in order to help um, to, like solve the crime in various ways. Each one is set to like a peripheral, or not peripheral, but a different tangent from which to work the case. And a new guy is brought on to work the like financial angle basically. And then they work the, the primary means of evidence and whatnot. So all of these people sort of form a much more interesting family unit, almost like found family. Um, Cassie and Rob are very close, beyond partners, um, but not still in a platonic state, a little bit off kilter, a little bit different. There's definitely some sexual tension, but it's not relied upon like most stuff in the genre. Um, and Scandinavian noir does usually have uh, partners paired up, and usually it does become a romantic thing. This, I think, handles it a lot more deftly, but 
couple that with the noir aspect in which Rob immediately tells us that he is not to be trusted, he lies all of the time, unreliable in the sense that we don't know what his motivation for lying is, even though we do know that he's lying about something and why he would lie about it. Um, uh, so there's multiple points of plot converging in this book in a really great way. It's it's definitely longer, I think, than most genre fiction in this field. Um, and the pacing is not a, like, genre fiction whatsoever. It is probably the slowest paced crime or mystery novel that I've ever consumed. The prose um, are kind of Raymond Chandler-esque, like they're very uh, vivid, effervescent, um, sometimes flowery, and they're used as obfuscation for what Rob is not telling us, or as almost dressing up what is happening between the lines that he's not telling us in a kind of Lolita sense maybe, where he's trying to get the reader off track or convince him or her, whoever is reading the book, that what is happening and his choices were um, inevitable, either justified, though they're unconventional. And so it also becomes about toxic masculinity through the lens of noir, which is just very fascinating to me because noir characters are almost, I would say, like <laughs> quintessentially problematic in the sense of toxic masculinity. And so Tana French is kind of weaving almost a feminist perspective through Rob in making sure that the reader doesn't believe him, doesn't trust him, and points out his inadequacies and his inability to confront his own um, situation as well as his own choices and the consequences that follow from them in the sense that most stories are about characters that get what they need, not what they want. This is sort of the ultimate novel for that, I think. It happens in both the A-plot with the girl who was killed, it happens with Rob, with his uh, continued sort of dissension of authority, his pushing of boundaries with all of his co-workers, especially Cassie and what she does uh, in response to that, but also their camaraderie and the love that they clearly have for one another. There are long times in this book in which they never find a clue and they don't think they will find a clue. They're spinning their wheels, which has a really interesting effect on all of the plots throughout. And so it's not even really a, I mean, it is a whodunit, but while you are introduced to all of the characters, as you might expect, you'll probably figure out who the culprit is quite quickly, but you won't know what's going on with Rob's trauma. You won't know um, the drama that is kicked up, I guess, from Cassie and Rob or the other aspects of the situation, nor do you know how the narrative tension will resolve with Rob pretending essentially to be a different person and working his own case and what that does with his own memories. We get multiple digressions into the past as some things come up when he sleeps. It's just very well handled on all fronts. It's captivating. The pros, like I said, are excellent. If you like the types of prose work that I'm discussing, it's not uh, Hemingway-esque in the least. It's very uh, obfuscational, flowery in some sense, but very well written still. Uh, but accessible because it is still um, commercial fiction. The girls I dream of are the gentle ones, wistful by high windows or singing sweet old songs at a piano, long hair drifting, tender as apple blossom. But a girl who goes into battle beside you and keeps your back is a different thing, a thing to make you shiver. Think of the first time you slept with someone or the first time you fell in love. That blinding explosion that left you crackling to the fingertips with electricity, initiated and transformed. I tell you that was nothing, nothing at all, beside the power of putting your lives simply and daily into each other's hands. So it's not that it isn't romanticized in a typical noir or genre fiction way, um, but more that it feels honest 
even as you know that it's a lie. So in that sense, the B-plot supplants even what's happening with the dead girl and what is the clues and how it's progressing and how it unfolds. But even better, I think, is that the ending in this is absolutely perfect for me. Some people are gonna hate it, but I thought it is telegraphing of exactly what is needed in the story, as well as what is earned by Rob and Cassie. The fallout feels very um, realistic, not so much fair, but has what should actually happen and not sort of splinter at the seams with its realism when it comes to conclusions in order to satisfy genre convention fans. And so that just made it even more impressive for me. I ended up loving this book. I gave it five stars. There's darkness, there's drama, there's a lot of well-handled things about trauma, I think, and the trauma cycle and the ways in which people caught in that cycle perpetuate it, either becoming uh, a predator or prey of somebody else in the cycle as well. And then we also have Cassie herself, who is very subversive of type, I think, and is able to be humanized but not sexualized in the same way that most of this genre fiction typically goes. And her articulation of her thoughts and her feelings, her professionalism and her beliefs are very interesting. Everybody has like these secrets at the heart of them in the novel that the, everything basically turns on. It's almost Donna Tartt-esque in that way, though not written at all like Donna Tartt. Um, the character profiles and um, characterization, I guess you could say, all spins on that axis though, the same way that Tart does, where there is something not being articulated and we continue to move around them until we get to see it. And when we do, we understand much more about each character as we do. And subsequently, all of their motivations and their choices make a lot of sense even if they were previously frustrating or um, detrimental to the things that they were trying to succeed at, which feels, again, very realistic to me. If you've read In the Woods, let me know what you think and feel free to uh, comment below. But if you talk about spoilers, obviously mark it, please. And otherwise, I will see you next video. Bye.